He goes to his mother who is 100 years old right now and that is of course Asma radiallahu anha. And he says, my mother, my support has evaporated. Very few people are standing with me and pretty soon they're going to give in too. Should I surrender? And this mother who's blind right now, she says, my son, <clears throat> if you fought for the truth, then who cares how many followers you have? Go and seek the martyrdom that Allah may have written for you. And if you fought for this world, then may you be destroyed because you killed your father. You have your followers killed and tortured in the process for what? You, because you were fighting for dunya? If you're fighting for the truth, then go and seek that martyrdom that you should have been chasing all along. And then she asked her son to come close. He's like, let me smell you for one last time. And they knew this was their last embrace. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi wa wala. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, welcome to Sunnah Fix. Our weekly session where you and I become inspired, hopefully, by the prophetic etiquettes. As you know, every week we take one hadith, really, and try to go deep into it, extract gems and pearls, and try to apply it into our own lives, so we become the best versions of ourselves. Today, we're going to move on to hadith 281, where Abdullah ibn Zubair tells us something about his mother and his aunt. So, Abdullah ibn Zubair says, مَا رَأَيْتُمْ رَأَتَيْنْ أَجْوَدَ مِنْ عَائِشَ وَأَسْمَى He says, I have never seen two ladies who are more generous than my mother Asma and her sister Aisha radiallahu anha or his aunt. And he goes on to say that these are the two most generous souls that I know. However, their mode of generosity was kind of different. As for Aisha radiallahu anha, فَكَانَتْ تَجْمَعُ الشَّيْءِ إِلَى الشَّيْءِ حَتَّى إِذَا كَانَ اجْتَمَعَ عِنْدَهَا قَسَمَتْ As for Aisha radiallahu anha, she would let things kind of accumulate. And when something has become money or food has become of sizable quantity, then she would give it up. And you know, you can understand her thought process because if a beggar is coming to her, she wants to make sure she's not doling out like half a meal or just scraps of bread. She wants to give something meaningful, something sizable that would satiate that person. Satisfy that person. But as for Asma, he says, فَكَانَتْ لَا تُمْسِكُ شَيْئًا لِغَدْ As for Asma, she would not save anything for tomorrow. She had this ironclad trust in Allah that I don't want to go to bed without giving out whatever that can be given out. And she had this trust in Allah that Allah will take care of me tomorrow like He takes care of the birds. Their nests are empty. They go out hunting in the morning and they get fed. God will take care of me. So she would not save anything for tomorrow. So that's Aisha and Asma for you. Now you guys, in our hadith studies that we've been doing, we've covered the life of Aisha radiallahu anha. But we have not talked about Asma bintu Abi Bakr radiallahu anha. Today, I want to dedicate this session to her life. And folks, let me tell you, preparing for this session was chills and tears. And I hope I can kind of transfer that to y'all. Such a beautiful life, a life of courage a life of patience and a life of generosity. So let me tell you a little bit about who she is, just some key facts, and then I wanna focus on these, these, these three themes. Her generosity, her patience, and then her bravery and courage. So let's begin with some basic overall facts. This is Umm Abdullah, she, her kunya is after her son Abdullah. And she is of course a Qurashiya, Taymiya, and she is the daughter of the greatest human being after the prophets and that is of course Abu Bakr radiallahu anh. She is the older sister of Aisha radiallahu anha but you gotta keep in mind she's a half sister. Half sister of Aisha because her mother, Asma's mother, her name is Qutayla. And scholars say likely she did not accept Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anh was married to her in Jahiliya and then he divorced her. As for Aisha's mother is Umm Ruman. So they have different mothers but the same father. So they're half-sisters and Asma is roughly 10 years plus older than Aisha radiallahu anha. She will give birth to the Khalifa himself, Abdullah ibn Zubair, who will be a Khalifa for a brief period of time. And Ibn Ishaq radiallahu anha tells us that Asma was probably the 15th person to accept Islam. Which is an insane deal if you think about it. Because early on in Mecca, there's no political reason, political incentive, social incentive to accept Islam. Except if you have sincere conviction. You are actually signing up for a life of Islamophobia. You are signing up for a life of a target on your back. So if you accepted Islam in those days, and she was a teenager when she accepted Islam, 
She was the 15th person, person according to Ibn Ishaq radiallahu anha. And having said all this, let me now tell you about her famous title. You got to remember this, folks. If someone uh, knows that you learned about Asma and you don't know this title, you don't know her. She was labeled, given this laqab known as Dhunnitaqeen, which basically translates into uh, the woman of two belts. So back in the days, ladies would have something called nitaq. Nitaq is a belt that you put around your waist. So a waist belt is called a nitaq. She tells us that when the Prophet ﷺ began his migration, he left Mecca, he's headed to Medina, but as you know, the Prophet ﷺ, instead of going north, he leaves from the south to trick the enemies and to create some misdirection. So he left from the south and he stayed three days in Ghar, Ghar al-Thawr as we know. As the Prophet ﷺ is hiding out along with Abu Bakr radiallahu there's an elaborate plan that's unfolding. Part of the plan was that Asma is going to deliver food to the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr while they're hiding in the cave. Mind you, she's pregnant at this time. In her trimester, third trimester, and she has a responsibility of delivering food while the entire city of Mecca is on high alert, bounty hunters are roaming around, and she's the one delivering food. And she would come to the cave discreetly deliver food. She tells us that as she's preparing these two bundles of food. She's like, I don't have anything to tie the food with. So she, her, she took her waist belt, ripped it in half, so she can wrap up the both bundles of food. And then she would deliver it to the Prophet ﷺ. In one narration we're told, the Prophet ﷺ saw her coming. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ said, O dhunni taqayn, O you, the woman of two belts. Allah will replace your belts with the belts of Jannah. Implying, this is a lady, a woman of Jannah, radiallahu anha. And this is how her title, Dhunni Taqeen, stuck. And you're going to see later in life, people will refer to her by this very honorary title and naqab that the Prophet ﷺ lovingly gave her. Now, three things about her life that I want to focus on. Number one is her generosity. As it was mentioned in the hadith earlier, that she would not save anything for tomorrow. She was addicted to giving and charity and donations. Unreal. Abu Muhammad ibn al-Munqadir, he says, Kanat sakhiyat nafs She was an amazingly generous soul. She would not hold her hand back. And her own son tells us that she would not save anything for tomorrow. She would free slaves and she would look after the sick. Truly a heart of gold. And all of this generosity that I'm telling you about becomes very special when you find out that she had a very difficult life. And when you understand the backdrop of her life, that she's not growing up in a lap of luxury. She's not sitting on a massive amount of resources and her net worth is in the you know, Forbes list of Mecca. She's not that. And yet she gives. Look, it's one thing to give when you got a lot. It's another to give when you're living off of scraps yourself and you're struggling yourself. We're told about her patience. That's the second theme I want to get to. That she was someone who got married a year or two before migration. And as the Prophet and Abu Bakr left, we are told that now time has come for her to migrate as well. And you guys, she migrates from Mecca to Medina, which is a, roughly a journey of 11 to 15 days under the burning sun of Arabia on pregnancy. Now, those of you who have been, who are aware of the restrictions upon ladies in their third trimester, they're told by the doctors to stop heavy lifting, you need to cut down on travel, you need to cut down on work. You're told that you cannot be putting yourself in certain situations. All that are the recommendations we're given. She is doing hijrah on pregnancy. In fact, we're told on the way to Medina in Quba, when she reaches Quba, she will have her delivery. And of course, she's gonna give, a, she's gonna give birth to a very tough child, and that is Abdullah ibn Zubayr. The toughness of the mother just transfers to the son. This Abdullah ibn Zubayr, I mean, this is a guy regarding whom it was told to us that even as a child, when Umar, Umar bin Khattab would come through the streets of Medina, all the children would scurry away from the alley. Abdullah ibn Zubair would stand firm like a rock and he wouldn't get scared. This is, the, this is Abdullah ibn Zubair who at the age of 13 will fight jihad with his father and they will both be on their horse. One, so if I recall correctly, Zubair ibn Awam is standing double wielding a sword while his son is the one driving the horse. And I mean, this, this was like a like a powerful destructive duo radiallahu anhuma so abdullah ibn zubair is born and she had to do all that while she is at the verge of delivering 
And as I told you earlier, that she was also tasked by the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr to deliver food while she's in this condition. Now, as the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr, they're hiding in the cave. Abu Jahl is on high alert. He's got bounty hunters looking for the Prophet ﷺ and part of his strategy, he's kind of like the, he's got his intel network, of course, keeping an eye on any movement on the horizons so someone can report back and tell us if there were two shadows creeping around so they can send people and I think they promised like 100 camels for anyone who captures the Prophet ﷺ, dead or alive. So, this is happening and now Abu Jahl is going door to door to prominent companions to see if someone is giving them refuge, if someone knows about their whereabouts and their location. And of course, he's going to come to the house of Abu Bakr anh. This Abu Jahl is described to us as someone who's like an intimidating figure. Some say he was as he was as dominant in his stature as Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu was. This Abu Jahl is not someone who is hesitant to even kill someone. Remember, he's the one who murdered Sumayya and the family of Ammar ibn Yasin. This intimidating figure going door to door and finally there's a knock on the door of Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is not home, he's long gone. The problem is long gone. Who opens the door? Asma bin to Abu Bakr. And, of course, Abu Jahl <coughs> inquires, where are they? In a very intimidating manner, she holds her ground and she's like, I have no idea. Narration tells us that he smacks her in the face so hard that her earrings go flying. But she withstood her ground and did not betray their location. Radhi Allahu anha. And <coughs> while all of this is going on, her father, sorry, her grandfather, is in the house, he's blind, he has not accepted Islam yet. And he continues to taunt her and the entire family for being so dedicated to the Prophet ﷺ. Her grandpa, Abu Quhafa, he's obviously the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he will accept Islam 10 years later. He is not a Muslim yet. So, Abu Quhafa says to uh, Asma, and they're both in the house, he's like, and he says some triggering words. She's being slapped, smacked around by Abu Jahl, and Asma tells us that when the Prophet ﷺ left for Medina, Abu Bakr took whatever saving he had with him, 6,000 dirhams or 7,000 dirhams. So there's not much left in the house. And there's obviously harassment and Islamophobia. All this is happening and Abu Quhafa comes to her and he says, I know he has no time for you and no money for you. Because all he cares about is Muhammad ﷺ. What's her reaction? She has just been physically abused. She's out of money. She has no idea what her future looks like. Her life is potentially in danger. You know what she does? It's, this, is, this tells you the attitude in suffering. You know, suffering with dignity and, and having that beautiful fasabrun jameel. She goes to a niche in the house, a hole in the wall, and she says that I took a bunch of stones, put them in a piece of cloth, and then I rolled it up, and I took it to my grandpa, and I started kind of shaking it. And those stones started making noises as if they, these are a bunch of coins. And then she puts it on his hand. He's blind. So she takes advantage of that. And she's like, oh no, our father left all of this wealth behind for us. So he's like, oh, I had no idea. If that's the case, then we're good. <laughs> and he backs off. And she does that in the middle of the eye of the storm. She should be resentful. She should be down in the dumps. She should be like, why am I being used? Why isn't he here? He should be the one dealing with Abu Jahl. Why me? But radiallahu anha, this is the life of patience that she had, radiallahu anha. And when she moves to Medina and she delivers and uh, the child is born, her life does not get easier. She is married at this time. Now, I didn't tell you who she's married to. She's married to Zubair ibn Awam, who's a warrior, a military general. He's usually out and about with the Prophet ﷺ on expeditions. Hadith comes in Muslim that Asma tells us that I married Zubair radiallahu anha. And at the time of marriage, he had nothing except for one horse and one camel. That's all the assets that he had. And she's like, I am in this relationship right now. He has no time to take care of these things because he's out with the Prophet ﷺ guarding the frontiers. She's like, I'm the one stuck, literally. And you read the language and you feel her pain. She's like, I'm the one stuck. Taking care of his horse, 
taking care of his camel. I am the one who has to prepare the fodder. I am grinding date stones to prepare food for his horse. And on top of all this, I have to knead the dough and I'm not very good at it, she says. Good, good thing I had Ansari neighbors who were helping me out because this was not my cup of tea and I'm having to learn all of this, you know, training on the job. And then on top of all of this, Zubair had land that the Prophet had gifted him about two miles out, roughly. And she's like, I have to deliver and transport date stones on my head to that land and back. And she's like, I'm living this rough life, grinding it out. One day I'm returning after having transported these date stones. And as I'm coming back, the Prophet ﷺ is riding with a few of his companions on a horse. And they see me walking by myself, carrying stuff. And the Prophet ﷺ, what about a gentleman? The Prophet ﷺ stops the whole thing, the whole little caravan that's with him, the battalion that he has with him. And the Prophet ﷺ makes his horse or his camel, actually his camel, kneel down. And he says, why don't you ride upon this? He offers her a lift. Asma says, I could have used that a lot. And I mean, God knew the pain she's feeling in her knees and uh, how fatigued she is. He's like, but I told the Prophet Ya Rasulullah, I'm too shy. And she's like, I remembered the ghira of my husband Zubair. What he would think if he saw me riding with a bunch of men. So she said, I'm too shy Ya Rasulullah. And then the Prophet also, of course, continued on his way and she walked home the rest of the way. Now you guys, just want to make sure you understand the concept of ghira. You guys get what ghira is? Ghira is this protective jealousy we have towards our mates, our spouses, um, sense of protection we have that we don't want to share our sexual partners. And by the way, psychologists, sociologists, they tell us now, like David Buss, he's like a world-renowned scientist, they tell us that this behavior of ghira, they have a term, modern term for this, it's called mate guarding. So, it's actually biologically rooted, this ghira, this maid guarding, because we observe this behavior, first of all, in the animal kingdom. So amongst Japanese beetle, you see this amongst grasshoppers, you see this amongst gorilla, where they actually uh, engage in these elaborate gestures and techniques to protect their mates. It's unreal. And then of course, if you, when you study human societies, all human societies had some form of veiling. I wouldn't say all, but many human societies, Chinese culture, Greek culture, that some sort of veiling some sort of covering that was instituted for women to create gender separation in the spirit of maid guarding. And um, I share all of this with you because this phenomenon is biologically rooted and it has existed in many different cultures. And by the way, men are not the only one who engage in maid guarding. Women do too. They have their own subtle ways, of course. So for instance, in our culture, we have the concept of wearing a ring. A man has to wear a ring because he has to communicate through that ring, I'm off limits. That's maid guarding. Or for instance, if a lady is walking with her man and there are a bunch of women around, she's going to grab onto his arm. Why? To let everybody know he's off limits. Find your own. And there are obviously other, uh, other techniques or what I like to call reputational damage that ladies indulge in to make sure that no woman is eyeing her spouse. So for instance, there are terms like home wrecker and many other forms of shaming that exist. Put a lady in her place from engaging in promiscuous behavior. Anyway, maid guarding is a thing. Ghira exists on both sides. Um, and this, this, this is a biological reality to protect or to maintain a sense of fidelity with our sexual partners. Long story short, she, after refusing the Prophet's offer, she walks home. And when Zubair comes home, radiallahu anh, she tells him about the whole scene that occurred. And you know, subhanAllah, he gave a beautiful response. He's like, you know what hurts me the most? What hurts me is not the fact that you would have potentially ridden with the Prophet ﷺ. What hurts me is that you are in a position where you're having to do all of this physical manual labor by yourself. You having to carry these date stones and walk two, three miles and back. You being in this position hurts me and breaks my heart more than anything else. Ghira and everything aside, we'll talk about that later. He didn't know fully what kind of physical strain she's going through. Later, Alhamdulillah, uh, Asma tells us that Abu Bakr عنه, was able to gift her a servant. And now that servant would help her, you know, with dealing with the horses and the camels. And she says, Wallahi, I felt as if, if, as if I was emancipated. عنها. And I, I don't know, I, I, one comment and quick reflection I wanted to share with you is that this is her life after suffering Islamophobia in Mecca and now dealing with this grind and the grueling life here in Medina. And you know, our Prophet told us 
that if you're going through hard times, look at someone who has it worse than you, which is one of the reasons why we do biographies, folks. Because I know first-time mothers who are having a very difficult time. There's a depression that kind of occurs. Of course, it doesn't help that you, you gotta wake up two, every two, three hours in the middle of the night. You're stuck with that baby and there seems to be no end to this dedication and devotion that you have. There are people who come home from work and they get headaches, they get their, their drain. And there are people who don't even own their own weekends. And you go through life and like, you're like a hamster on a wheel or like the story of, in, in Greek mythology, you have a story of a, of a person who's being punished by having to push a boulder up the rock. And then the boulder is made to fall down and he pushes it up again. And then it falls down and he pushes it up again. Now, a lot of people feel that way about their life. They're like a hamster on a wheel. So from her story, we learn, inshallah, inshallah, with hardship comes ease. And that was something that happened to her. She had moments of hardship, moments of ease. And now what I like to do, is move on to the final part of our life and that is her courage. You guys, Asma radiallahu anha, we're told in a narration, she would sleep with a dagger under her pillow. Why? During the reign of Sa'id ibn al-As, who was one of the governors of Medina, roughly around 40 Hijri, there were a lot of thieves in Medina that had kind of shown up and theft had become a bit widespread, unfortunately. So she would sleep with a dagger under her pillow and she would say, anyone who dares step in my territory, they're gonna talk. To, they're gonna talk to the dagger, and it reminds us, reminds you and I in our day and age of carrying a gun. You know, I, I bring this up because when the concept of having a gun in the house comes up in my family, everybody starts getting like heart attacks. They shudder in their boots, and Asma sleeps with a dagger under her pillow. You know, just the concept, the boldness that they had is unreal. She participated in the Battle of Yarmouk with her husband. She's not only our aunt, radiallahu anha, but she's also a mujahida, radiallahu anha. And I want to fast forward now to the last story that I'd like to share with you. And this is the one that really just had me in deep reflection. So, towards the end of her life and the life of her son, Abdullah ibn Zubair, who I introduced earlier. Remember I told you he's going to go on to become a khalifa. Abdullah ibn Zubair for years was an independent khalifa. And he had kind of broken away from the Umayyads. Umayyads were the reigning dynasty at that time. And Umayyads, of course, hated Abdullah ibn Zubair. He was like a thorn on their side. And they were trying to get rid of him, but they couldn't because he is hiding in Mecca. And Mecca is a sanctuary. They couldn't really touch him because everybody respects the sanctuary that Mecca is. But at that time, Umayyads were able to find a military general who's so ruthless, whose reputation is so... Uh, whose reputation has, is so blood-stained that till today our scholars scowl and frown when his name comes up. This person would spill blood like you and I drink tea. And of course I'm referring to none other than Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf, who killed many scholars, many children of the companions. And this Hajjaj ibn Yusuf appeals to the Umayyads. He's like, send me and I'll take care of Abdullah ibn Zubayr. And this Hajjaj ibn Yusuf will deploy every brutal, grotesque, tactic out there to flush Abdullah ibn Zubair out. So what did he do? He laid siege to Mecca for six months, cut off food and supply. And remember, this is not Medina where there are date palm trees. They're surviving on Zamzam, but even Zamzam cannot suffice the entire city. Long story short, for six months, food and water supply has been cut. And then he erects catapults and he starts throwing catapults in Mecca, destroying the Kaaba in the process. And Kaaba had to be rebuilt. This is Hajjaj ibn Yusuf for you. Now, Abdullah ibn Zubair's supporters, they stood strong initially, but when food and water is out, narrations tell us, reports have reached us that people were eating animals from the street. That's how bad the situation is. And slowly, of course, the Umayyads offer a deal to everyone, amnesty to everyone. You leave Abdullah ibn Zubair, we got you. Slowly, his support starts to frizzle out. He's left with a very few supporters. So, he goes to his mother, who's 100 years old right now, and that is, of course, Asma. And he says, my mother, my support has evaporated. Very few people are standing with me and pretty soon they're going to give in too. Should I surrender? And this mother, who's blind right now, she says, my son, <clears throat> if you fought for the truth, then who cares how many followers you have? Go and seek the martyrdom that Allah may have written for you. And if you fought for this world, then may you be destroyed because you killed your father. You have your followers killed and torture in the process for what? You, because you were fighting for dunya? You're fighting for the truth? Then go and seek that martyrdom that you should have been chasing all along. 
And then she asked her son to come close. He's like, let me smell you for one last time. And they knew this was their last embrace. And as they hugged each other, he kissed her forehead. She felt an armor on him. And she said, what is this armor? This is not the dress of the martyrs. So he took the armor off. And for one final, um, you know, one final glorious battle, he went out, fought. And uh, unfortunately, of course, one of the most um, sad moments of Islamic history, he was brutally killed. And the Umayyads did not just stop by killing Abdullah ibn Zubair. They crucified him on a pole right outside of the gates of Mecca. So for anyone who would come, they would see the rotting body for weeks. And basically sending a message, anyone who revolts against us, that's going to be your fate. Now, the situation is tough. Abdullah ibn Zubair, like... I, I, you know, you gotta see things from Asma's perspective because she lived with the Prophet She has seen the era that when Abdullah ibn Zubair was born, Muslims were saying, Allahu Akbar. They were rejoicing because Abdullah ibn Zubair, according to some, was the first baby born in Medina. And now the times have changed so much, 70 years after the Prophet that his body is being crucified. So much has changed. So much corruption has unfortunately reared his ugly head. She wants the body of Abdullah ibn Zubair, her own son, to be brought down. But no one is listening to her. And we're told in a narration that Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab who's still alive, he passed by the body of Abdullah ibn Zubair. And he says, I told you not to do this. I told you not to get politically tangled up with them. I told you. But then he goes on to say, but I know that you were sawam and qawam. You were someone who was deeply engaged in worship of Allah through qiyam and through siyam. And if you are the worst of the ummah, this is the great ummah. He's saying hypothetically, if you, the state that you're in right now where people think lowly of you, if this is what our low person looks like, Ummah is in good shape. So, when Hajjaj finally heard what Abdullah ibn Umar said, they said the body of Abdullah was finally taken down. And then this rude, brutal human being, like seriously, like a guy with like a no soul, he says, bring me dhunni taqayim. And she refuses. So the guard goes back and tells Hajjaj she's not coming. He says, tell her that if you don't show up, we're gonna drag you by your hair and bring you to my court. No respect for the companions. Such, like, forget poor Adab. I mean, he, this is a situation that Ummah had to deal with. So the guard goes back to Asma and, and basically delivers the news that if you don't come, they're gonna drag you by your hair. She says, I dare him to touch my hair. And she refused to come until Hajjaj himself picked up his shoes and went to the house of Asma and he says to her, the first thing he tells her is like, What's, uh, What do you think what I did to this enemy of Allah? Referring to her son. You know what she says? She's like, what I see, you're asking for my opinion, what you did to my son? She's like, what I see is that you ruined his dunya, but he ruined your akhirah. You, you may have ruined his dunya, but he actually ended up ruining, ruining your akhirah because you just spilled Muslim blood. And then he goes on to uh, taunt her further and call her names. And then she right here exhibits the famous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that one of the greatest jihad is to say kalimatul haq, you know, ila sultan in jail. One of the greatest jihad is to say the truth in the face of a tyrant and a dictator. So first of all, she says, I am dhul nitaqayim. And I'm the one who took care of the food of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're going to try to make fun of me? She stood her ground, a hundred-year-old lady. And then she says, And as for you, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say that from Thaqif will come a liar and a mass murderer. Thaqif is the tribe in Ta'if, which is where Hajjaj is from. He says, I heard the Prophet say, from Thaqif will come a liar and a mass murderer. As for the liar we have already seen, that's Mukhtar al thaqafi as for the mass murderer, I cannot think of anyone but you. I am certain that the Prophet was talking about you. She says that to him in his face. Narration tells us he could not respond to her. He could not clap back. And this is the boldness she had in the face of Hajjaj. And she made a dua to Allah later. And she says, Ya Allah, do not let me die until my son is given a proper burial. So the body of Abdullah was taken out, taken down. And she herself gave him a ghusl, covered his body. Like a mother, blind, 100 years old, is doing 
shrouding and the ghusl of her own son's body. She buries him, and narration tells us a week later she passed away. I, I mean, you know, it just seriously brings tears to the eyes that her life never eased up. One suffering after another, losing her son towards the end of her life in this brutal manner, having to deal with a tyrant. And she was who she was, the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And folks, really this tells you, this dunya, is this dunya is not the place for ultimate justice. We try to seek justice in this world, but this world will never offer perfect equilibrium and utopia that Marxists so zealously chase. This is not the place for it. And Asma radiallahu anhu passed away 73 hijrah, roughly at the age of 100. And she was the last of the muhajirah to pass away. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless her soul. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit and really exemplify her bravery and to have patience and steadfastness in the face of adversity and afflictions. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.